I saw your ad. My name's Ian. Hello, Vic. Long time no see. Hi, Charles. <laughs> this is the story of a ladies' man, a man who exuded charm and lies and violence. Which airline are you in? Virgin. I love New York. Perhaps I'll take you. It's a story that Crime Watch didn't in the end resolve, but public appeals and dogged police work did, though not before he caused a trail of wrecked lives and heartache. And come on, it's wakey wakey. I left my key at the gym. Stuff this. Anne? Anne? Anne! Hi, Julie. Sorry to call you in, sir. Christmas and all that. How is she? Not good. Is that the husband? Yeah, Brett Fiddler. Not a domestic, then? If it is, it's the worst case I've ever seen. Medics said her head was bashed through it. Dear God. I think she was expecting someone. No idea who. No, but I can guess what they came for. Massage for professional gentlemen in relaxing surroundings. Full discretion guaranteed. This phone number. Don't touch anything, Paul, will you? Hi, Julie. And a happy Christmas to you too, Roy. Victim still here? They've taken her to hospital. Kitchen's a bloody mess, and I mean bloody. Do your best. Don't I always? Do you think her husband knew about the adverts? Don't know. He found her about 5.30, he says. Called the medics. They called us. Think she worked alone? We're checking, but it looks like it. She could have opened the door to him. So we've got no names to go on? Found a few numbers in a book downstairs. Checked a couple. One was her mum. Did you speak to her? No, I thought I'd leave that to you, sir. Strange sort of marriage, isn't it? it? Takes all sorts. He's a lot younger than her. They run a gym together just down the road. He was there all day until he came back and found her, he says. Have you got anything? Maybe. It's a bit of a mess. I'll let you know when I know. ASAP, Roy. Let's nail this guy. Sir? Mm -hmm. No, she hasn't spoken yet. Excuse me. What's up? If she says anything, we've got to get it on tape. Well, she won't be speaking for a long time, but we'll do our best. Eric, any doctors around? They're in theatre, sir. And? Touch and go, I think. Has he said anything? Nothing that makes much sense. Said he had to break into the house. The door was locked. Didn't he have any keys? Mr Fiddler? DCI Stickler. This must be terrible for you. Are you all right? Me? Yeah, yeah. Look what happened. I was hoping you could tell us. Look, I told the other guy all I knew. We'll have to go over it all again. When you're ready. I'm sorry. Is there anyone we should contact? I was told to give you this, sir. How is she? Touch and go. Even if she makes it, it's unlikely she'll remember anything. Surgeon said he'd never seen such injuries. Roy said he'd found some samples, good ones, and two distinct blood types. He's getting on with DNA testing. Tell Eric to get a blood sample from Brett Fiddler. He's still at the hospital. What about house to house? I've called it off for now. Start again first thing tomorrow. Bins. Bins? Yes, bins. Time to call it a day, sir. It's bin day tomorrow. Got to get it stopped. He may have dumped something. I don't fancy rummaging around the council tip to find it, do you? Eric, you still at the hospital?
What about yesterday? Well, we was out most of the day. Wife's parents. I was just putting the car away over the back there, and that's when I saw him. He ran across the garden and jumped over the fence. Wife saw him as well from the upstairs window. Well, look, I don't know who said what, but there's one in front of me now. Big white thing, yellow, flashing lights. What time was this? About fresh. Can you describe him? Tall, well-built, fit-looking. The boys say there's a refuse collection van picking up stuff in the area. What? They promised. Tell the driver to stop now. If he's collected anything, get the van down to the police pound and search it. About four. You left the gym about four. But you didn't get to the house until about 5.30. It's not that far from the gym, is it? About ten minutes. So what were you doing for an hour and a half? Hanging about. I phoned a couple of times. She was expecting a client. You said yesterday that you rang her about a quarter to three to leave a message on the answer phone, and you were surprised when she answered. Well, yeah, I thought. Well, you know. That she'd be otherwise engaged. But she wasn't. And then she said her 2.30 hadn't turned up. Is that correct? Yeah. These items were found near the scene that appear to link with the crime. Do you recognise either of them? No. This chisel doesn't belong to you? I don't think so. You don't think so? I've got a few tools, yeah, but they're in the shed. Do you know any of the men who visited your wife? She led her own life. Anyway, we needed the money. The gym wasn't doing too well. Weren't you worried about her? And worked out she could look after herself. I'll um, keep this short. The briefs you've got of most of this in. Julie. Basically, there was a very nasty assault yesterday afternoon in Eastleigh that left Anne Fiddler in a coma. She's only just hanging on. We've got two officers by her bedside. The surgeons are doing everything possible. And we've got to hope she remembers something. We've already interviewed the husband, Brett, and his story is slowly checking out, so it looks unlikely that it's him. Roy. We think she was attacked first with an iron, then bottles, then a knife. This man was enjoying himself. He slammed her head through the glass oven door. That accounts for the extent of her injuries. If she survives, and that's a big if, she'll have permanent brain damage. On the plus side, we managed to link blood samples at the scene with some found on items in the bag, two distinct blood groups. We've also got a lovely palm print off of one of the bottles. It was held like this. And the point of impact we've discovered was here. So, we've got a lot to go on. The trouble is, the prints we have aren't on computer, so the team are going through a stack of boxes, which amounts to something like 129,000. Just so we know what we're dealing with here, a man entered Anne Fiddler's home at about 2.45, and 15 minutes later, he had done all this damage. Eric, what's coming out door to door? One of the witnesses has put together a CD fit. We've got plenty of copies, so show them around. You've seen what he's done. We need to find this man. There's been some press interest. It seems that Anne Fiddler was working in Whitehall. Until recently, she was a secretary in the Cabinet Office. Which puts a different slant on things. Uh, you want anyone to go to London? Uh, New Year's Eve in London, Eric. Sorry, mate, I want you out talking to her client. Shake up suburbia a bit, see what falls out. We're also talking to Vice to see what they might have, weirdos, whatever. The options are someone from the gym. We're setting up DNA testing there. Could be a burglar. She disturbed him. Check out the faces. We've also the nightmare scenario. We've got a loose cannon out there. It was always uh, of great concern that uh, we were looking for an individual um, who perhaps hadn't come to the attention of the police before, or who had come to the attention of the police before, but from another police area. Uh, when would he strike again? Is your mother in? 
Uh, yeah. No, well, she will be soon. Good. I've got something for her. But you've got a key, haven't you? I told you, the mortise lock is on and her car's not there. Which man? Is he still there? He had a check for Mum, some insurance thing. I sat in his car for a while. It was cold. Kate, he could have been anyone. Is he still there? No, he had to go. What about Mum? Well, she's obviously been delayed. I'll give her a ring on her mobile. I've done that. There's no answer. Why is the door locked? I'm sure it's nothing. I'll stay there. I'm on my way to pick up David for a match. I'll be there in about ten minutes. OK? OK. Bye-bye. What the hell were you doing in his car? It was just warmer, that's all. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you ring me? He tried on his mobile. Yours was switched off. I've told you about this before. Don't talk to strangers. <sighs> Dad, I'm fine. It's Mum we're worried about. She said she'd be back at four. I'm sure she's fine. Why? Anything could have happened. She could have crashed the car. Katie, I've already phoned the hospitals. That's the first thing I did. She's never late. I know. I know. No, and she never leaves the mortise lock on. Dad, she doesn't. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'm rather concerned about my wife. How are you there? Hello, you all right? Should we take a look then, sir? Sure. I think we'll stay here, shall we? Just for the moment. It's the mortis, that's the problem. Have you got a key, sir? I don't live here. I thought you were married. We're separated, Glenda and I. Wait out. Right. But you do have some interest in the house? Yes. Is there another window? Around the back. What's that? Anything missing? I don't think so. I don't think anything. So has this happened before, Mr. Hoskins? Before what? Not coming back. Staying out late. Well, she goes out quite a lot, yes, with friends. But she never leaves the kids. Anyone special? Friends, I mean. Yes. Wendy, Karen. Men friends? I don't know. But she does have men friends. She's an attractive woman. Why shouldn't she have men friends? Is there anything up there? Uh, it's just a loft. There's a ladder. Has he used for anything? I don't think so. Let's do it then. Look, everything seems to be okay. There's no sign of any forced entry. This is Mum's coat. And she had it this morning. She has lots of coats, sweetheart. This is her favourite. She was wearing it this morning. When was that? When she took us to school. About nine o'clock. Her mobile phone's gone. We've tried ringing. She could have left a message on the answer phone. That's all right. We pulled it down. We'll just have a look. Well, see, these are missing. Does it matter now, David? No. I mean, they've gone. You mean they've been stolen? Are you sure, David? Can you describe them? Remember the titles? OK, look, sit down. We'll take some notes. Are you sure they've gone? Yeah. OK, well, look, why don't you tell me what they're doing? Well, there's a blur.
What? Oh, no, coffee. Look, I'll come with you. I just heard this. Uh, just a horrible, horrible scream from Katie. Um, and I rushed up into the attic, pulled her out of the attic and, and started looking. I don't know what she'd seen. I, and I, I remember shouting to her, what did you see, what did you see? How could you let this happen? Brian and her dad had looked in the loft before we went in. And they missed her? No, well, they weren't looking for a body and they only had a flashlight. Tony Hoskins didn't know that there was a light switch in the cupboard. Why not? He doesn't live there. The girl does, which is why she knew the carpet had been moved in the loft. And the body was under the carpet? Yes, sir. And where's PC Haley now? At the house waiting for Socko to arrive. Hmm. Look, I'm sorry about this, sir. You will get your clothes back. It's just that um, forensics need them. Uh, Fibre samples, you know. Um, eliminate them from anything else they might find there. Yeah, well, um, if you could just come with me then. And if you wouldn't mind waiting uh, with WPC Johnston, uh, just for a little while. It's all right. Have a cup of tea hmm? uh, in the canteen. It's closed, sir. Find a can of Coke or something. Okay, this way, sir. I wish I hadn't given up smoking. Uh, I don't, I'm sorry. Shall I get you some? Uh, Mr. Hoskins. Tony? We need to try and find the car. Car? Oh, uh, yes. Um, white uh, Ford Escort Cabriolet. Do you know the registration number? Uh, I'm not sure. It's uh, L... One three eight. Doctor's on his way. Oh, well, want to see that you're okay. It won't be long now, and then you can go home to your dad's. This has happened. Is there anyone that I should contact? Friends? Mum's got lots of friends. What was she doing in the attic? She doesn't go into the attic. No one does. It's cold up there. No, we just drifted apart, really. Was this just a temporary arrangement? No, no. We both see other people get on with their own lives. And children don't mind? If they do, they don't show it. They're great kids. Is it a nice school? It's okay. Any friends? Yeah. Anyone special? And your mum? Any special friends? And Wendy and Karen. Vic? He wasn't special, just thought he was. Well, the kids know him better than I do. I only met him once or twice. He was round a bit at Christmas. He was a right man. But your mother liked him. Mm, yeah, to begin with. And then he wouldn't leave her alone, even after she chucked him. This Vic, do you know where he lives? We don't know. We never went to his place. Oh, he's always around ours when he was up in Belgium somewhere. Do you have his phone number? Um, in, in Mum's address, I guess, but... Hi, DC Dixon. Charlie. Can I have the handbag, please? Sorry? I need something from the handbag. Hasn't been examined yet. Right now, phone numbers are more important than prints. The numbers may be in her address book, in the handbag. Well, I hope you're right. Have you ever heard a chain of evidence? I'll be careful. Well, keep your gloves on. Don't drop it. Let me have it back as soon as possible. All units look out for a Ford Escort Cabriolet White, registration number L138DNF, 
Registered owner, Glenda Hoskins. I've put out an old ports warning on the car, sir. The boyfriend might have taken it. The deceased daughter said he spent a lot of time in Belgium. All right, Chris. What's this about a missing mobile phone? It's a pink mobile phone, according to the daughter. I've got the number. Get onto the phone company, see if it's still being used. If it is, get all calls logged. Yes, sir. I'll see you there. And the family being looked after. We're doing our best, Mr. Hannah. I have a Vic, V-I-C, no other details listed. Telephone number 01705 427454. That makes it Portsmouth. Subscriber listings show a Victor Farrant, F-A-R-R-A-N-T, on that number. Sir? Chris Harvey here yet? No, sir. Hello, Roy. David, this is a nasty one. Has she been moved yet? No, we'll be moving her soon. Transport's on the way. What can you tell me? Well, I think she was moved up into the loft after she was killed. Trying to hide her, obviously. Mm. Any early signs? A significant bruising around the mouth and neck, also on the ankles, and signs of a sexual assault. In the bathroom, there's a broken soap dish and other signs of a struggle. I'm guessing we'll find water in the lungs. She was probably drained. Any idea when? It's cold up there, but difficult to tell, but Doc thinks probably yesterday mid-morning. Sorry I'm late, so I got delayed at the phone office. A night staff on, they said they couldn't access the records. And? Uh, should have the log first thing tomorrow morning. Any more on the boyfriend? Uh, Victor Farrant, yeah, we've got a phone number and there's an address in London Road. Yeah, gone. Sent two DCs round, place was empty. I'm trying to get someone in, checking any prints that might be there. Sir, I thought you ought to know, we've just run Farrant through the computer. Um, Victor Peter Anthony Farrant, released November 1995 from Ashwell Prison, served eight out of 12 for rape. Ladies and gentlemen, at approximately one o'clock this morning, the body of a mother of three, Mrs. Glenda Hoskins, was found at her home in Senan Place, Port Solent. This is being treated as a suspicious death. We are anxious to trace a gentleman by the name of Victor Farrant. This picture is believed to be a good likeness. He may be driving Mrs. Hoskins' car. It is a white Ford Escort. Cabriolet. Morning, sir. Thanks. Just heard from the hospital. They're moving Anne out of intensive care. Good. Perhaps we should send her some flowers or something. I'm sure she'd appreciate that. She'd appreciate it even more if we could nail this guy. Yeah, don't tell me. Seven bloody weeks. Not much to show, is it? Mr. Hannah's press conference? Yeah. Mean anything to you? Victor Farrant. Can't say it does, sir. Glenda Hoskins, blonde, early 40s. Seven weeks after Anne. Different MO, but... They've got a name, we've got forensics. Let's put Farrant's name in the system and see what comes up. There's a lot of women at risk while he's on the run. Yes, sir. You've got it, Rob. Panic buttons on all the homes, surveillance on friends and family. Victim support, it's important. I've done it many times. Sir, I've got the mobile phone log. Uh, someone was using her phone up until seven o'clock last night. We plotted him moving along the south coast. Last calls from Ashford. Rail terminal. That's my guess. Yeah, he's also been ringing numbers in Belgium. I've got them here. Get them checked. Get someone down to Ashford, see if he was spotted there. Okay. And we'd better speak to the Belgian police. Paul. You know that name you mentioned earlier, Victor Farrant? Had a call from Superintendent Hannah over on the Hoskins case. They think there might be a link. Right. Get on to Roy. I want a priority action. Put him on the top of the list and get his prints. That might take some time. We don't have time. Inspector Guido Machi, please. Uh, EC Inspector Harvey. Uh, Division Criminale, uh, Hampshire, Angleterre. Nouveau Long. Flemish. No, I don't speak Flemish. How many tapes is that? Ten. He's got to be in there somewhere. When did Mr Hannah want this? Yesterday. Good morning. How are you feeling? Anne, we found a name. Victor Anthony Farrant. There's nothing on him in Hampshire, but he was done 20 years ago in Cambridge. So they're going through their files and they're going to fax over his prints. So please, nobody touch the fax, right? 
any one of the fingerprint officers in the department could have identified the marks against Victor Farron. I'd looked at that mark for several weeks, in fact, so it was well ingrained. I happened to be near the fax machine as they, as they came through from the relevant force, and, and as soon as that, that fax copy fell over and I could see the images on the screen, I knew straight away that we had had the offender for the uh, Ant Fiddler offence. Unbelievable sense of uh, euphoria, really, that uh, at last the weeks of work that we'd done hadn't been wasted, but in fact we'd now identified that individual. Get me Chief Inspector Stickler. It was a, a very big relief when I heard that we had a name which matched the palm prints on the bottle. I had mixed emotions, one of relief, excitement, that we'd actually ultimately identified a man who we believe is now the offender, um, but also um, some sorrow that someone else had suffered at his hands, if that was the case. It's very difficult to, to look back sometimes, because at that time we didn't know for sure that Victor Ferrant was responsible for the death of Glenda Hoskins. <laughs> That's him. Camera 51. That's not your star, that's domestic. Domestic? Ramsgate. He's heading for the ferry. I think the case involving Victor Farrant was one of the most frightening and chilling cases that I've ever had to deal with. That was mainly because we were dealing right from the outset with someone who was quite clearly a serial offender and our fear was that he could harm somebody else before he was caught. Can I have your attention, please? Some of you will know DCI Paul Stickler. He's in charge of the Ann Fiddler case. He's just received proof positive linking Victor Farrant with this assault. As from today, the two incident teams will merge. Not only uh, was every police force in the country alerted very early on to it, but we were um, alerting other countries via Interpol. And as I said, the, with the all ports warning, which was pushed out, um, the sad thing about that is that within um, half an hour of the all ports warning um, going out, he had arrived half an hour earlier in Ostend in Belgium. But we've checked the ferries and there were no bookings in the name of Victor Farrant. Well, this might help. I've just seen a woman who worked with him for a couple of weeks. He was selling bingo cards door to door. That's his ID. He was calling himself Charles Kelly. Good. Well, that's a recent photo. Get it on the posters. Right. Yeah, the one that was on the telly. It's part right opposite. And Got a where would that be exactly the car, sir. The woman's phoning in from Plaster. Plaster? One of the numbers found rang from Glenda's mobile was in Essex. That's not far away. Uh-huh. Let me have it. Thanks. Sir, it's about those calls you made on Glenda's mobile. The Belgium numbers? Yes, sir. Four of them were to prostitutes. We've checked and they're OK. But one was to a Dorrit Pedersen. Works as a translator for the Council of Ministers in Brussels. And she hasn't been seen for several days. Keep at it. DCI stickers on it, sir. I'm off to London to see a man about a car. Derek Dugan. Yeah. Who wants to know? D.I. Harvey, Hampshire Police. This is D.S. Bennett. Sorry? Do you know a Victor Farrant? No. Oh. Funny. He telephoned here quite a few times, actually. I don't live in the place. I'm just looking after it. Yes, we know. For Mr. Patel. You live in Plasto where the car's parked. Thank you for seeing us. Inspector Marchier asked me. He has been most helpful in tracing some telephone numbers for us. We are anxious about a lady named Dorrit Pedersen. She's not been seen for two days. We feel it might be prudent to gain entry to her house. She's the kind of woman that Farrant seems... Without proof of any crime being committed, I cannot authorise entry. Travelling on a forged passport is a crime. Yes, but not a crime relating to Dorrit Pedersen. Unless you are suggesting she is responsible for the forged passport. Not at all. But on behalf of the Hampshire police, I must emphasise the urgency to apprehend Victor Farrant. His picture has been circulated. What more can I do? Circulate these. This is what he did to a woman I found in a house in England. I hope Miss Pedersen is not lying in her house in the same state. 
Ultimately, we gained authority to search the house. Uh, the house was searched by the Belgian police, and we found certain art artefacts in there, which demonstrated quite clearly Victor Fant had been there. Uh, but obviously, the primary aim at that stage was to establish that Doric Peterson was safe and well, which we did. I think the low point of the inquiry was when we just missed Victor Farrant by less than 24 hours uh, in Belgium. It became increasingly difficult then to identify exactly where this individual had got to. Uh, we launched an unprecedented poster campaign throughout the whole of Europe with a free phone telephone number from a number of different European countries back to the UK in the hope that someone would see and recognise Farrant and ring the UK and tell us about him. And you don't know Victor Farrant or anything about him? No. Surprising, given all the stuff about him on television. I don't watch much telly. I don't like it. You don't mind appearing on it, do you? For the tape, I'm showing Mr Dugan still frames from CCTV surveillance at Ashford Rail Terminal, bearing record of date and time. They clearly show Victor Farrant and... Do you think that does you justice? OK. I met the guy a couple of times before. Then he rings me up out of the blue. Says he's going away for a while and, and his girlfriend wanted to sell the car. He had all the documents. Could I help? I said, no problem. The problem is that the girlfriend was found murdered the day before you picked up the keys. No, I don't know anything about... Which, in the absence of Victor Farrant, leaves you facing charges of receiving stolen property and a possible accomplice to murder. You know Victor Farrant. Most recently at Ashwell, where you were doing time for... Forgery. Farrant left Ashwell in November. And like the old cons you are, you agreed to keep in touch, right? In touch is one thing. In the shit is another. Shall we start again? We're ensuring that Victor Farrand was being regularly seen on television programmes, that we kept it as high profile as we could. I mean, there was, there was an urgent need to actually catch this man. You may have read about it in the papers. Just before Christmas, Anne Fiddler was savagely attacked at her home in Eastleigh near Southampton. Then in February, and also on the Hampshire coast, Glenda Hoskins was found dead in her home in Port Solent on the outskirts of Portsmouth. She was a former girlfriend of the wanted man. Victor Farrant hasn't been seen since, unless you know otherwise. He's 46, about six foot. He can put on Irish and quite convincing upper-class English accents. He uses all sorts of names, including Charles Kelly, and likes to pretend he's a professional man, though he's much more likely to be working in a bar or on a building site. He has a liking for escort girls. He was last seen in Brussels. Vic told us he was inside for fraud. And that's how you two got together, was it? He was an OK guy. He was a guy in jail for rent. Oh, <laughs> anyway, Vic didn't need to rape women. He could have any woman he wanted. He reckoned he had a woman inside the last nick he was in. Do me a favour. Oh, you'd be surprised, lad. So, tell us about Charles Kelly. He was a nobody. Vic got hold of his birth certificate and got a passport. And what about Glenda Hoskins? Do you remember her visiting him? It's a blonde one, in the 40s. Yeah, she'd visit him sometimes. And he'd write to her. His missus, he called her. He could charm the pants off anyone to get what he wanted. He even wrote letters to the prison governors. And if they were women, so much the better. What for? To get a reduced sentence, home leave, move to an open prison. And he was doing well. Till some bitch stuck the boot in. What bitch? Some probation officer. I can understand that Victor Farrant presented to almost all women as very charming. He was good looking. Uh, he was well-spoken, excellent manners. Yes, I, I, I felt from the very start that that was the danger of the man, knowing what his offence was. He could get 
almost anything he wanted, even within the prison system, if there was a female making a decision. Victor Farrant loathed his probation officer because she saw straight through him. She recognised how dangerous he was. So much so, she arranged to have all his phone calls monitored. He was a convincing liar. When Glenda Hoskins found he was in prison, he'd persuaded her, as he'd persuaded others, that he was there for an insignificant offence. When Glenda discovered the truth, she broke off the relationship. That's presumably why Farrant killed her. After a while, when they knew that he was overseas, it wasn't always so much him that we were scared of, but because of what had happened, we were just a lot, I don't know, more scared of things in general. I, I couldn't um, go into a room without the light on. It took a long time for us to convince the family and the friends, and in fact everybody involved, that he ha was in fact out of the country, and there was always that element of doubt. Their biggest fear was the obvious one. Where was the man responsible for Glenda Hoskins' murder? And was he going to come for them? That's, that's the obvious fear that they had. And obviously, that's our job to alleviate that fear and, as much as possible, make them understand that we were there for them and if they needed us, we were at the end of the telephone. I'd got to the point, I think, you know, my brothers and my dad had as well, where you almost feel that you know, he'll never be found, you just can't sort of visualise it happening anymore. We did push Interpol quite hard and, and work very closely with them. But they, they were able to circulate a, a letter which uh, I drafted to 148 different police uh, services throughout the world and 28 European capitals. Victor Farrant was at home in continental Europe. He spoke French and had worked in bars and on building sites in Belgium, France and in the Netherlands. After Crime Watch and other similar appeals, there were sightings of him everywhere. But over six months, the calls began to focus most on Spain. In fact, Hampshire detectives were in northern Spain when a backpacker touring Europe arrived in England, yet another witness sure that on his travels, he'd seen the wanted man. And you're convinced it's the same yeah, man? Yeah, positive. OK, I'm going to have to call this in. We've got a guy just coming off the ferry. He says Farrant's running a hostel in Nice. He's calling himself Charles Kelly, but he's convinced it's the same man. Je veux parler, s'il vous plaît, avec l'inspecteur André Bloch. Oui, oui, c'est ça. Nice, inspecteur André Bloch. Yeah. Bon. Yeah. <laughs> Monsieur Kelly, what passport, s'il vous plaît? The passport, please. Well, that's at the hotel. Yes, sir. Oh. Well, just go and get it. Have a drink. I'll be right back. No. Nous allons rentrer tous. Excusez-moi. The time of his arrest was the most frustrating time of the inquiry. Um, it, it happened to be the time when I had chosen to take two weeks annual leave. Um, I spent six months on this inquiry, 14, 15 hours a day. Hardly any days off. I take two weeks off and he gets arrested in Nice. It had taken six months to find him. It now took seven months to get the extradition sorted out before Victor Farrant could be handed over by the French authorities to the detectives who'd spent so long hunting him. Thought you lot had never turn up. This place is terrible. Can't wait to get back to a decent prison. Victor Peter Anthony Farrant. You're under arrest for the murder of Glenda Hoskins and the attempted murder of Anne Fiddler. We do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if we do not mention something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be used in evidence. You want to get in there? She's a bit of a goer. A bientôt, chérie. See you soon. Toujours les rêves, cochon. See what I mean? I think she said, in your dreams, Arsene. But I could be wrong. <laughs> when we actually went over and got him, um, it was a very, very strange sensation to meet the man who you knew was responsible for such horrific deeds. Obviously, on the journey home, I was handcuffed to him. Um, it was strange to be so close to somebody who you'd spent so long chasing, who you'd spent so long looking for, who you'd only learnt about through other people's opinions. It was quite 
difficult to understand how so many people were fooled by a man who didn't really have a life and who found it necessary to create a character to impress people. Can we Good turnout, turn eh? Hey? Yeah, Can but mind you, you go please? for that publicity stuff, don't you? Yeah. All those posters must have cost a fortune. The detectives were appalled by Victor Farron's attitudes. At no stage did he show any remorse at all. Woman driver. Silly cow. They all want the same thing, you know. Sweet talk. Yeah. I bet your wives are the same. Are you married? Yeah, well, you know what I mean. They want this, they want that. What about what you want? They never learn, do they? Do as you're told. Know who's boss. Yeah. Only some of them don't listen. <laughs> they need a lesson. They needed a lesson. <laughs> Can't have a woman telling you what's what. When it comes down to it, they all want the same thing. Someone to tell them what to do. Then, well, there's no problem. Everybody's happy. Under the laws of extradition, none of us can talk to you about any aspect of this case. Which is great pity. Because there's a great deal to say. And ask. See you in court, Mr. Farrand. In January 1998, Victor Farron's trial began at Winchester and we went to, to see him in court and I can remember him coming into the dock and just, I, can, I was visibly trembling, I couldn't stop shaking and trembling, I just wanted to just get out over that, sort of, over the seats of the wall, grab the man. We wanted to see him as soon as possible because Almost to sort of partly to see what effect it will have on yourself because you don't want to sort of shy away from things and then wonder in ten years' time, you know, what would have happened. He, um, and I also wanted him to have to see us. She wanted to be downstairs so she could see Victor Farrant's face when the result was announced. Ladies and gentlemen, this press conference has been called following the conviction today of Victor Farrant for two of the most cold-blooded and chilling crimes that this force has experienced for many years. It is also an opportunity for Paul Stickler and myself to pay tribute to the dedication of a team of detectives who have worked tirelessly on this inquiry for a period that has spanned almost two years. He typifies the, the most dangerous offender that we could ever deal with in the probation service or the prison service. The charm that uh, covers hatred when he was sentenced, Lord Justice Butterfield told Farrant that he was too dangerous ever to be released again. Those are the most comforting words that I, anyone on the inquiry, or anyone associated with the inquiry or their families could hear. Anne Fiddle will be the first to tell you that um, she cannot believe she's alive today. She went through uh, an unprecedented level of violence that I've never seen before since. She finds it difficult to understand why someone has stepped into her life turned it upside down and then walked out again, leaving her to rebuild the life for herself. I just hope he never comes out of prison, never gets a chance to do that again. All three of them have been amazingly supportive um, to me um, and to each other. The mother wouldn't have wanted them to have uh, dwelt on it continuously and, and let it ruin their lives, and they've, they've really tried to be very positive about what they should be doing. But there's a huge emotional void all the time. Tony uh, and the children and, and, and her parents have received support from other people. Uh, we hope that the support that we're able to give them throughout the whole of the inquiry and indeed after the inquiry has helped in some way, but it will be a long, long time before any normality could ever be achieved.